Well, welcome everybody um, to this evening's talk. Um, we're absolutely delighted to be here at the Broadwick again. We had our first event here, partnering with the Broadwicks in April, which was a fantastic success. It was a really fun, glamorous evening with a great speaker. So, um, yeah, it's great to be doing it again, and we hope we'll, we'll do some more. And we're also uh, very grateful to uh, Pomelo for uh, sponsoring the um, the drinks this evening. Um, I haven't tasted one yet. I didn't dare because if one's, <laughs> one's taken out, I won't be able to ask any questions anymore. But I am going to have one at least afterwards. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, we're also delighted to have Sarah Bowles uh, from the British Museum with us tonight to talk about her current exhibition, Michelangelo, The Last Decades. And um, you'll see that there are some, some of the exhibition catalogues there. It's a fabulous exhibition. If you haven't seen it yet, I really, really highly recommend going to see it. Um, and I'm not going to say anything more about the exhibition because I'm going to ask Sarah to talk about that in a minute. I'm going to introduce her properly in a minute. But first, let me tell you briefly about Athena. So my name is Nicola Jennings. I'm the director of the Athena Art Foundation. We are a UK-based art charity. We operate online. Our mission is to engage more people with pre-20th century art of all around the world. Um, I run it with a number of uh, colleagues who are uh, academics, who are curators. Um, we're all very enthusiastic about art. Um, and uh, we really just want to get more people it, to enjoy it and to study it and just to in, you know, learn more about it in a, in, a, in a fun way and go to more museums and support uh, art generally. And we also often do uh, talks about contemporary artists who are inspired by the art of past centuries. So it's not just uh, historic art, there's a, there's a, bit, of, a bit of both as well. Um, and so we have, um, we have a YouTube channel, uh, which you can check out. We have lots of uh, little films that we've made over the last few years. Uh, we have an Instagram. We, have, uh, we do these digital events. We just did one last week, which was fantastic, on, the, uh, on Sargent and fashion. There's a wonderful exhibition uh, at Tate Britain at the moment. And uh, we were very fortunate to have this wonderful uh, costume historian from Parsons School of Design in New York who agreed to talk to me about Sargent and fashion, which was fantastic. And I'm going to put it up on our, our YouTube channel next week. So, um, so do, do watch it. And we also have, um, we also have uh, uh, what else do we have? Digital events, a website. So yeah, please do check it out. And we're also setting up a new small club uh, for anybody interested in coming to little gallery events to get sort of insider access to things uh, called the Owl Club. So if you want to know more about any of these things, please do ask me or Luca after the talk. Um, so just to, uh, to tell you about the order of play tonight, so Sarah and I are going to talk for about 35 to 40 minutes, um, and then there'll be 10, 15 minutes of questions. If anybody uh, has questions, do ask Sarah. And after that, plenty of time for more socializing. So um, so I think um, I would just like to ask you very kindly to um, switch off your mobile phones, because I'm sure you agree with me that we want to give Sarah our absolutely full attention. And also, we are filming. The event's being filmed. So obviously, if phones go off, that would be um, uh, very annoying, and I hope I've switched mine off, because if it's my phone that goes off, I'll really look stupid. Um, <laughs> so anyway, if you do need to make a, a call, please, if you would mind going out into the lobby. Um, so, Sarah Bowles is the Smirnoff family curator of Italian and French prints <laughs> and drawings at the British Museum in London. Yes, they could sponsor our next event. <laughs> and Sarah is the lead curator of the current exhibition, as I said, Michelangelo in the last decades. She studied at the University of Oxford and the Courtauld Institute in London, and she began her career at Christie's, where she worked for six years as a specialist in the Old Master Drawings Department. So, you know, that's where it comes from, I would say. <laughs> um, before joining the British Museum in 2014, and her exhibitions include Mantegna and Bellini at the National Gallery, Piranesi, Visions of Antiquity at the British Museum, and the British Museum's international touring exhibitions, Italian Renaissance Drawings, Christ, Life, Death and Resurrection. So a lovely, lovely trio of exhibitions there. So 
Sarah, tell us a little bit about the exhibition and why drawings are so important to understanding who Michelangelo was. Um, yeah, so when you're thinking about Michelangelo and in fact about any Renaissance artist at all, you've got to remember that whatever they do starts with drawing. Drawing is the fundamental skill that you get taught first as an apprentice and you have to master that before you're even allowed close to colours. So when Michelangelo is thinking about anything, he always starts with drawing. And um, a good example of this is his work for The Last Judgment, um, with which we start the exhibition. I've got a few reference images here. This is not by any means a lecture PowerPoint, so there might be slides we skip entirely. Um, so this is The Last Judgment. I'm sure you're all familiar with it. Um, the way that you use drawing to think is absolutely vital. So thinking about The Last Judgment in particular, it's a fresco. And that means that you have to know exactly what you are doing before you start painting, because you've got to finish each bit before the plaster dries out. And so that's why we have these amazing preparatory studies from several different stages. Um, Michelangelo is here using drawing as a way to fathom the entire composition. Um, he's starting with a subject which has been done many, many times before. He is bringing this new movement, this new dynamism, almost violence into it. And that's present right from the very beginning. The image on the left that we have here is one of the first drawings that he makes for it. He's looking at the whole composition and you already have that sense of movement. Um, drawing is absolutely you know, central to his process of plotting out his ideas. And you can see that, you know, having plotted out his first thoughts, he then moves on to developing individual groups of figures, and then just to skip through to, to figures, you know, individual figures, and they're not necessarily major figures. Drawing is the basis of all his preparation, and he must have made hundreds upon hundreds of drawings just for this one project, um, because this figure you see here, it's an angel in the top corner. No one's going to see it at close range at all. But he still spends this time really fathoming out the muscles and how the light falls. And it's the same for this chap here with the elbows who appears at lower left. So, you know, he's putting an enormous amount of time and preparation into this. And this, the same goes for his sculptures. When you look at his sculptures, there are preparatory drawings for that. We have a, an amazing drawing in the show where he's actually thinking about a design that he wants to turn into a, a sculptured group. Uh, it's a crucifixion with the Virgin Mary and St. John the Evangelist. And he uses drawing to plot out the shape of the marble blocks that he's going to have to cut and the dimensions that they should have. Um, it's really the way that he thinks. And throughout his entire career, this remains the same. Um, and as maybe we'll talk about a little bit later, towards the end of his life, Drawing is what he turns to when he is trying to process questions about mortality and salvation and whether he thinks his soul is ready for that. Um, so from the point when he starts learning as a very young man to the end of his life, drawing is the first thing that he turns to. You know, right up until a few weeks before his death, he is still sketching. Um, and I mean, I think that just shows, first of all, that he's <laughs> you know, he's not going to let anything get the better of him. Drawing is something which he does like sculpting to some extent. It's a way for him to process all the thoughts in his mind, even at the very end of his life. Um, so Yeah, and it's, it's such an extraordinary thing to see the drawings because, I mean, the, the Sistine Chapel is amazing. I don't know if, if any of you have been to see it. I'm sure some of you have. But for me, this is where you really get excited about Michelangelo's work because you see him you see him actually creating, you see his mind, you see this sort of act of his mind joining up with the paper. And art theorists talked a lot about that, didn't they, in the, um, in the 16th century, and about you know, the creative process and how important drawing was. Yeah, that's absolutely right. When you're looking at these drawings, there's something so intimate about them. Essentially, you're creeping into his studio and looking over his shoulder and watching him develop all of these ideas. So. It's a very privileged position to be in. And yeah, in the 16th century, when people talk about drawing and design, they call it disegno, diosegno, it's sent by God. You know, the act of creation through design is divine inspiration. And of course, Michelangelo becomes particularly associated with that idea of, of being divine and drawing inspiration directly from God in the way that he works. Um, so, 
I think for me, when I started getting interested in drawing, it is precisely that intimacy which always appealed to me. The fact that you can look at a drawing like this and almost imagine that Michelangelo's popped out for a cup of coffee and he's going to be back in a minute. You know, there's really that, that freshness to them. And I'm almost certainly biased, but I think sometimes work loses its, its immediacy when it's turned into a painting. <laughs> I am certainly biased. <laughs> and um, the thing about drawing as well is that it serves so many different functions for Michelangelo. So in this particular case, we see him using it as a preparatory tool, but we also in the exhibition have examples of him using it as something for gifts, for friends. And maybe that's something um, to go on to now. So um, for example, if I, oops, if I go forward, the drawing on the left that we have here is Funnily enough, a preparatory drawing for a drawing. Um, so this is one of three or four drawings that he sends to this young friend of his, Tommaso de Cavalieri. And in this drawing here, he is trying to create something which works in and of itself as a work of art that he then sends to Tommaso. And the wonderful thing about that particular drawing is the note on the bottom where he, is, he sends this to Tommaso and he says, let me know what you think. You know, if you like it, say so, and if you don't like it, let me know. And he actually says, I'll do another one for you tomorrow if you don't like it. So these are things that he can produce pretty quickly. Um, but this in, in particular is something which is eventually intended to have its own life, its own existence as a drawing. Um, and this really is the point in art history when drawings start becoming valued as independent works of art. You know, the first collectors of drawings, people like Giorgio Vasari, are active round about this time. And Michelangelo has a role to play in that because he's so famous and it's so hard to get a piece of his work that actually getting a drawing by him is you know, as valuable as having a whole painting by another artist. Um, and so tell us a little bit about the story of, of the fall of Beethoven. It's a really interesting one and about the relationship between these two. Yeah, so when Michelangelo is making drawings for Tommaso, he tends to choose particular subjects. So they are scenes taken from Greek mythology, and they're scenes which have some kind of moral aspect to them, some kind of moral warning. So the story of Phaeton is that he is the son of the sun god, Helios, and Phaeton is immortal, and essentially has been telling his friends that he is the son of a god, and they just don't really believe him. So he goes to his father and he says, look, Dad, please, can I borrow the chariot of the sun and just drive it across the sky one day? You know, I can prove to everyone that you really are my father. And, and the sun god Helios says, don't be an idiot. He says, you know, even I find it difficult to control the horses that pull the chariot. You will have no chance. But Phaeton just will not let it rest. And eventually Helios has to give in. And so Phaeton takes the sun chariot and starts driving it. And of course the horses go completely wild. The sun ricochets around in the sky, it comes low in Africa and burns the Sahara Desert barren, and eventually you have Zeus who has to come in here at the top, literally deus ex machina, on his eagle, with his thunderbolt, and he shoots Phaeton out of the sky to halt all of this destruction. And so that's what we see here, that moment when the god has come in and is judging and Phaeton is falling out of the chariot with this amazing tumbling group of horses and limbs everywhere. And he's falling down towards the ground where his sisters, who are grieving, are being turned into poplars. And in the background, his cousin or friend, depending on different sources, Cygnus is being turned into a swan. And so it's basically a warning against arrogance. You know, be very careful what you do. Don't run before you can walk. Don't get cocky about what you can actually cope with. Which, when you think that these are being sent to a young man who's barely out of his teens, there is a certain element of, of a moral warning there. But the really interesting thing is that Michelangelo is creating these drawings for Tommaso at exactly the same time that he is starting to think about the Last Judgment. And I think there are parallels. So in both of these compositions, you have a god enthroned on clouds who is in the act of judging. Then in the next layer down, you have this group of tumbling intertwined figures who are you know, being judged. And at the bottom here, you have figures who have been damned or cursed or transformed in some way. 
And this, I think, is a really good example of how Michelangelo's ideas can be translated very easily between different compositions and, and also different sort of different sections of thought. So nowadays we would think that a religious painting and a secular painting do not go side by side very well, but Michelangelo could easily skip between the two of them. Um, we have another drawing that he made for Tommaso de Titius, um, which again is a mythological scene, an ancient sinner who is condemned to have his liver eaten by a vulture because you know, every day liver grows back overnight, vulture comes back the next day, has another meal. He draws this, which is a fantastic male nude, and then he flips over the paper and realizes that he can use this same pose for another purpose. So he traces it and turns it into a risen Christ. So you have that direct link between a pagan sinner and the, the saviour, which I think shows the flexibility of his imagination very well, and also the sense that there's this grey area, this very unclear dividing line between these two different aspects of his work. Can we, um, can we, can you tell us a little bit about Tommaso di Cavaliere and Michelangelo? Because you know we hear about Michelangelo's passion for this young man, and. Um, it would just be nice to know a little bit more. Yeah, so Michelangelo and Tommaso meet at the end of 1532. So at that point, Michelangelo is in his late 50s. Tommaso is 20, max. We're not entirely sure when he was born. And Michelangelo is basically overcome straight away. Um, what happens is that the following year, 1533, basically sees this flurry of correspondence because Michelangelo is in Florence, Tommaso is in Rome. So once Michelangelo moves back to Rome, they live literally a few streets away, so there's no more need to send letters. But for this sort of very heady first year of their connection, we do have a lot of evidence. And Michelangelo's letters are just beautiful. There's one where he says that basically he feels like this withered plant which has been brought back to life by this stream, which is Tommaso's affection. And then he says that he feels as if he's, he's wading into this stream to admire all of Tommaso's virtues. And he realizes that it's not a stream, it's this vast ocean with towering waves and he risks being consumed by it. So we're basically seeing a man who has never really felt these emotions before and he's not quite sure how to deal with them and they are overpowering and he expresses them both in letters and in beautiful, beautiful sonnets. Um, but we have to be very careful about how far we take that. So the, there are several reasons why we, in, when we were putting the book together, we thought about this a great deal. And it seems very likely to us that although Michelangelo's passion is very clear, that it's something which never made its way into the physical form. We have to draw a line between feeling something and acting on it. Um, there are several reasons for that. So there's a 40 year plus age difference, which in itself doesn't necessarily mean very much. But there's also a massive social difference, which at the time would have done. Tommaso is a nobleman, Michelangelo is, is an artist. Um, a really, I mean, actually another point is that we have Tommaso's letters to Michelangelo and he's clearly flattered, but he doesn't share that intense like physical attraction that you do find expressed in Michelangelo's letters. Um, the fundamental major point though is Michelangelo has been incredibly devout ever since he was a young man. So you've got to imagine he grows up in Florence when Savonarola is preaching the Duomo. Savonarola saying that, you know, vanities and vices like sodomy will send you to hell. Also Michelangelo's favorite poet is Dante, who places the sodomites in hell. So, Everyone around Michelangelo is telling him that if he actually acts on these emotions, he will be condemning himself. And this is a man who spends literally his entire life worrying about, oh my God, have I done enough to get into heaven? So I think we have to be very cautious about assuming that he would have responded in the way that people would nowadays. Although, as I've said to many people, I just wish he had gone to bed with Tommaso because it would have cheered him up enormously. <laughs> But there we go. <laughs> um, but the fact remains that they remain very close until Michelangelo dies. You know, on his deathbed, Tommaso, in his 50s, with a wife and children and, you know, career, he's there at Michelangelo's deathbed. So, you know, even if it wasn't physical, that doesn't change the intensity of the emotions and the profound admiration that both of them felt for each other. And I think that's a rather lovely story. <laughs> 
And I loved in the exhibition how you have you have many of the books with the poems and the letters written in them. And so you can actually read these texts because they're actually quite easy to read. They're surprisingly legible, aren't they? Yeah. Um, so it's it's very, very moving. And you know, and also his religious sentiment. I mean he was, you know, as you were saying, he wasn't he very devout and you really see him. But but for him being devout is all about the beauty that God has created and you know the beauty of the spiritual world, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. And to, to some extent, I think we can understand his fascination with the male nude through that lens as well. The fact that for him, man is created in God's image, so the male nude is really the closest that you can get to the divine. The beautiful male body is, you know, almost godlike. And yeah, and so, for example, um, if we just go back to the Last Judgment, the fact that when that is finished, a lot of people are upset about the nudity in it. Michelangelo, I think, would have found that very curious because he is showing a scene where people are being raised from the dead, clothed in flesh, and sent to meet their maker. And it's like, why, why would you have clothes? You know, you're, you're facing the person who basically made you. What do you have to hide? Uh, but unfortunately for him, uh, the other people didn't necessarily agree with him. And so just before he dies, The Last Judgment has draperies painted over some of the, some of the figures, um, upsetting me by one of Michelangelo's closest friends who must have found that a very difficult thing to, to deal with, and who then gets called the breaches maker by a lot of people for quite a long time. You can imagine he's probably quite annoyed about that. Yeah. Yeah. So, shall we, shall we move on to, in the exhibition, um, you talk about some of his collaborators. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that what we go next? I can't remember. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, so I, I, the reason I was interested in that was because when, when he was young, I mean, I, I know from, so I'm an art historian on Spain, and there's a young Spanish uh, artist who goes and wants to see his drawings, and he has to go through a very lengthy process of negotiation to be allowed to see a drawing by him. So Michelangelo was quite secretive, wasn't he? And yet he does decide to work with these collaborators. So I wondered what was it about, you know, what had changed? <laughs> Well, it is true that Michelangelo is very, very protective. Um, but even when he's younger, he does make drawings for close friends. So people like Sebastiano del Piombo, who he works with in the 1510s, he makes drawings for Sebastiano to use in developing his own paintings. I think what changes once we get to the 1540s and the 1550s is that Michelangelo is basically busier than he's ever been. He's in his 60s, coming up to his 70s at this point. His energy is flagging, but the demand for his work is just getting more and more. He's already the most famous artist in Europe. He's basically got clients uh, ranging from the Pope through various kinds of cardinals. He's had the, the French king writing to him, asking him to come to France, which he doesn't. So this is a man who is basically wanted by everyone. And he's getting a lot of people who want paintings of his designs, but he hates panel painting. He makes, you know, maybe three or four in the course of his life. It's not something that he really enjoys. He paints fresco under sufferance, but he doesn't really enjoy that either. And so what he does at this point is he teams up with someone who is very, very good at doing small-scale devotional paintings. And that person is Marcelli Venusti, who, if he's from northern Italy originally, Michelangelo meets him in the Vatican probably when they're both working round about the, the Capella Paulina. Um, and so they strike up this friendship. And Venusti is actually a bit of a genius. He's, he's kind of overlooked a bit, but what he does is he manages to work in the house style. His own drawings and paintings are very different in spirit. What he's doing here is he is giving people what they want, which is Michelangelo. And we have a couple of examples where we know that from the beginning, Venusti was going to paint the painting, Michelangelo was going to design it. Um, and the understanding of attribution at this time is almost the opposite of what it is nowadays. People want Michelangelo's imagination. They want his ingenio, his design. It doesn't really matter if Venusti is the one who actually paints the final painting because they still have a piece of Michelangelo. So here we have um, an example of an Annunciation that's commissioned by Cardinal Chasey in the mid-1540s. So Michelangelo's, one of Michelangelo's preparatory drawings is on the left. We've got several in the exhibition. And he works his way through all these different ideas about how to represent the Annunciation. This particular one, I think, is beautiful because 
It's very, very original. It shows the Virgin Mary just sort of sitting at her table. And the angel has almost, it's almost whispering in her ear. So you have this incredible, life-changing news, and it's just whispered. And I think there's something fantastic about that. It speaks to his own understanding of religion as something very personal and very intimate, um, which we see across a lot of his work. So then it's developed into this finished modello. Um, this drawing from the Morgan is in a bit of an attributional limbo at the moment. Uh, it's traditionally been called Michelangelo, but I think there are more and more people who are inclined to see it as perhaps Venusti. Um, there's a certain hardness to it, which I don't think necessarily matches up with Michelangelo. And then that is carried on by Venusti, who creates the background. So it's not a copy that he's making, it's really a collaboration, because he's given the figures, he adds the background. Um, and so this is something which becomes incredibly important to keep, in a sense, Michelangelo's other income ticking over on the side, because the Pope is just loading him up with all sorts of other commissions. He finishes the Last Judgment, probably hopes for a break. He gets asked to paint the frescoes in the Capella Paulina, the Pope's private chapel. And when that's done, in fact, even before that's finished, he's then lumbered with becoming sort of the chief architect of the Vatican uh, with obviously responsibility for St. Peter's. So he simply does not have much free time. And Venusti gives him the chance to disseminate his ideas and to deal with a lot more a wider range of patrons. Just in case anybody um, doesn't, isn't familiar with the Annunciation, so it's basically it's the moment um, when Mary finds out that she has is going to bear the Christ Child. So she, you know she's she's a you know a virgin, and the angel comes down and gives her God the message: "You're the chosen one." Um, is it Eke and Chilla? Uh, <laughs> yeah, the yeah. famous words, you know, lo and behold, young maiden, you're going to behold God, you're going to carry Christ. Um, so it's a very important moment in Christian life philosophy. Um, so do you want to say anything more about the others, or should we move on to the late, to the drawings? I think let, let's let's carry on and talk about the drawings a bit, and then. Um, um, well, I mean, if we're going to talk about drawings, we could have a quick talk about the years. So, um, really, the reason behind doing the exhibition in the first place is that the British Museum has the Epiphania, which is this literally monumental drawing. It's, it's over two metres tall. And until very recently, it's just been on display outside the Princeton Drawing Study Room. Um, but we decided that it was time to send it in for conservation. And for the last six years, my amazing colleagues have been lifting it off its old lining paper, freshening it up, revealing the edges, which has told us a lot about its history, six years. So it's been off view for six years. Um, and so this is really our chance to put it back on display. And we kind of built the idea of the exhibition around having this incredible late drawing back. Um, this is phenomenal because the work that's been done on it has enabled us to understand a lot more about how it was presented and used. Um, it's the only surviving complete cartoon by Michelangelo. Um, many of the others were broken up or lost or torn into pieces by souvenir hunters and this sort of thing. The reason that this has survived is because it was treated like a painting. So it was laid down on canvas. You can still see the imprint of the textile on the back of the paper. And it was then nailed onto a wooden stretcher and framed and put on the wall. And so we have lots of inventories where the frames are described and so forth. So that's why it's lasted today. And um, one of, at the centre of the exhibition we have this, and we've reunited it with this painting that was made after it by Michelangelo's biographer, Ascanio Condivi. Um, which is quite fun. It's the first time they've been back together for half a millennium since they were made. Um, and the Condivi painting, I mean, he, he is not the greatest artist in the world, I will be honest about that. But it's very interesting because the painting has been in Casa Buonarroti, Michelangelo's family home museum, since 1608, when it was bought by his great nephew, who promptly went around telling everyone that it was by Michelangelo. Because he was desperate to have a Michelangelo painting, and he had this opportunity to get the Condivi painting. So it's very, very good to have it back with the drawing again. Um, and. The, the drawing itself is a real mystery. We have no idea what's going on. Um, we have the Virgin Mary in the centre, we have the Christ Child underneath, and we have St. John the Baptist here. But aside from that, there is a lot of, of theory going on about who the other figures are and what it means. It's called the Epiphania, which is when the three kings come to visit the infant Christ. 
But that's only because after Michelangelo's death, the local clerk is brought in to make an inventory. And he basically has to describe what he's seeing. So he's shown this. He sees the virgin and child and maybe three grown men, and he just panics. And he says, OK, right, that's the three kings with the, um, coming to visit the child. And we've called it that ever since, but it's not that at all. Um, the closest that we've been able to get is that it's probably some kind of allegory of the divine nature of Christ. Um, so you have Christ between the virgin's legs, referencing the virgin birth, and she seems to be pulling aside some drapery to reveal him. Um, she's making this rather violent gesture towards St. Joseph in the background, which could be interpreted as the fact that Joseph has nothing to do with the child, <laughs> um, emphasizing the divine nature. So it's, there is still a lot to unpack, and um, you know, answers on a postcard, if anyone has any bright ideas. <laughs> Um, so this gives you a sense of the kind of drawing that Michelangelo is doing, say, 1550. This is you know, about 15 years before he dies. We are moving away from that very robust, muscular, masculine body that we saw with the Last Judgment. And this is something which becomes really obvious as Michelangelo gets older. His, his figures become more monumental, more solid. There's a real density to them that you don't really see when he's a lot younger. And um, if we go here, so this new style of drawing really comes to fruition in these very, very late crucifixion drawings which we have at the very end of the show. And I was talking earlier about the functions that drawing has or have for Michelangelo. And this is a particular example of him using drawing actually as a way to meditate spiritually. So along with Tommaso de Cavalieri, another of his friends who we spend a bit of time on in the exhibition was Vittorio Colonna, this amazing religious poet who, for whom Michelangelo made religious designs which she used as devotional tools to meditate. So Michelangelo is trying to undertake that same practice, but he is actually using the act of drawing, not a finished drawing or a painting, as a way to meditate on the prospect of mortality. When he's making these, he's in his 80s. He's lost virtually everyone around him, um, including very recently the servant who'd been with him for 26 years and who he was banking on to basically look after him in his old age. Um, the servant had a wife and two small children. It was a surrogate family for Michelangelo. And at a stroke, he has all of that ripped away. And so he's feeling very lonely and very sort of freshly aware of death and what that might mean. And so he's using these drawings as a way to try out different ideas about the psychology of loss and also the hope of salvation because the crucifixion isn't just miserable. There's also that hope that you will be resurrected at the end of it. Um, but you can see that that drawing style has now become very smoky, very ethereal. You know, the physicality of the body is no longer something that interests him. He's much more interested in sort of the, the spiritual body, if you like. Um, yeah, he's also probably not as, in his eyesight is probably not that good anymore. And his, you know, he may not be able to, to carry out. So he's kind of making a, a necessity into a virtue in a way, isn't he? Yeah. His eyesight probably was failing, but the, the real difficulty that he was having was with his hands because, yeah, we, we have, we have, the thing about Michelangelo is that he wrote a lot of letters and people kept the letters because at that date, if you got a letter from Michelangelo, you saved it. So we have about 500 of his letters that survive and they are incredibly valuable for giving us a sense of his everyday life, the kind of person he was and his health issues. And so we know that from the summer before he died, so mid-1563, his hands suddenly start going. Um, I think by that point he'd done these drawings, but I think you're right that we also do see the earliest stages of that failing dexterity here. Um, and there's this really poignant moment two months before he dies where, you know, having written letters obsessively for his entire life, he finally has to give up. And he says, look, my hand just isn't obeying me anymore. Other people are going to write for me now. He says, I'll still sign them. And he does. We have the, um, so we have that letter in the show, which is the final one that he ever wrote himself. And we also have the final letter that he ever signed four days before his death, which is probably the last time he ever picked up a pen, because I mean, the signature is virtually illegible, and it's, it's really poignant. You have this man who's been using his hands obsessively for you know, over 60 years, 70 years, and suddenly all of that has been taken away from him. The, the, the functionality that made him who he is has gone. 
Um, and it's it's that really, really poignant moment where he, he finally has to give in to what age actually means. You know, he dies two weeks before his 89th birthday. He is still powering on right up until the end. You know, he is determined as anything, but even he eventually has to give in to the demands of physicality, and I think that's really sad. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that's... If, if there's nothing else you particularly want to say, I think that's a lovely place to end. Okay. I mean, it's a very sad place to end. <laughs> it, it's not an upbeat exhibition. He dies in the end. Yeah. Sorry. No, but it is upbeat. No, no, it is upbeat because you'll go and you'll just be so overwhelmed by how beautiful and how extraordinary these things are. But, you know. and, and the book is 35 pounds, is that right? Yes. Yep. <laughs> yes, great. So do come and get, you can get Sarah to sign one for you. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much, Sarah. Uh, would anybody like to ask questions? I'm sure somebody please, will. Please do. That's my here. Yeah, I've got a question. So how old was Michelangelo when he was um, sort of attending the preachings of Savonarola? He must have been really young. Yeah, he was. So he was in sort of his late teens, or less, or sort of you know early twenties. He's he's very very young, and he's at a very sort of influential stage in his life. So um, he, Condivi, the guy who painted the Epiphania and also wrote the biography, he actually says that Michelangelo has said to me that he can still hear Savonarola's voice in his ears as if it were yesterday. So you know he even 60, 50 years later, that is still a huge impact on him, and he is very conscious of it. Yeah. Um, and I, I think imagine so like Leonardo wasn't parading his atheism at the time really. They weren't in touch very much, but he was like a little bit older, but he wasn't really. But Leonardo was a little bit older. Um I'm not quite sure how Leonardo felt about Michelangelo. Michelangelo didn't really like yeah, Leonardo, but then he didn't really like Raphael either. He didn't like yeah, quite a lot of people. Them liked him. Yeah, there's this famous story, um, because of course they were both in Florence in 1504, there's this exhibition coming up at the RA um, this autumn where they're looking at that moment where you have this interaction. You've got Leonardo, Michelangelo and Raphael in the same city. Um, and yeah, Michelangelo is known as an expert on Dante. Leonardo is hanging out with some friends, talking about Dante. They see Michelangelo coming and Leonardo says, well, let's, let's ask Michelangelo what he thinks about this. And Michelangelo goes to his default, which is paranoia, and assumes that everyone is making fun of him and basically says, well, you explain it, and storms off. So, you know, he's, he's not the easiest person to, to get along with. So his, his interactions with Leonardo were pretty limited, I think. Um, but yeah, I mean, the extent to which one really could be atheist at this point is an interesting question. Um, so yeah, maybe that's something to think about in a bit more detail. Um, so does, I might have missed this, but does Helios die when he gets struck him out of his car? Uh, Phaeton. Uh, yes. Oh, sorry, yeah. Yep, yep. Yeah, the Greek myths are unforgiving places. Yeah. He, he dies. So I, I read that like his head survived. Oh, that might be Orpheus. Okay. Yeah, the poet. His head gets cut off when he's killed by Maynard. As I said, it's a pretty ruthless place to be. And his head then goes floating down the river, um, singing nice. a strange song. That's Orpheus. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Basically, just don't use a time machine to go back to Greece because it may not end well. <laughs> I'll try not to. <laughs> Anyone else? I mean, I'll be around so you can come and ask me questions in person if you prefer that. Well, Sarah, that was amazing. Thank you so much. Um, I think everybody's really enjoyed it. So, shall we give Sarah? Um, may the fun go on. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.